Mr. Perkins, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, earlier, you mentioned the uh, Mercer report on compensation and that it was altered. Uh, do, do you, uh, if you have copies of both of those, can you table those? I don't have copies, but I can provide, again, people have to be taken out of their NDAs to pri provide evidence of that happening, but there are executives and other Okay, I'll, I will, I'll ask the committee if the committee with uh, consent will ask for the uh, tabling of those documents with the committee, please. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the Mercer, the, the unredacted Mercer report, the pre- and post-edited Mercer reports that the witness referred to. SDT. Sorry, I, I've just stopped the clock. Mr. Perkins, what, what are you asking for? The, uh, I'm asking if the committee will request the production of from... Uh, SDTC or PCO, whoever the appropriate body is, he has those of the Mercer reports. compensation reports that the witness said were altered. Uh, All right. Is there any disagreement on that? There is none. Thank you very much, Mr. Perkins. Uh, you have four minutes, 20 sec seconds. Thank you. Um, uh, you mentioned the meetings. Uh, ADM Noseworthy was in all the meetings where the investments were decided. Now, the Auditor General found 82% of the, her selection were conflicted. My understanding is that those meetings started off with a recitation of which directors were conflicted with, with which project. Is that correct? Correct. So they briefed all the board members or all the investment committee members about which director was conflicted with which before they said, now we're going to vote on Jake's yep. project. So they all knew whose project it was. Awfully convenient. Maybe that's how 82% got. So I would also mention that, you know, when um, the ex-chair was at committee, I think on Monday, she mentioned that, you know, irregardless of the um, lack of recusals, there was a full and thorough review done by the board members on every single project, which is also a lie because at that point in time, SDTC was doing bulk approvals of projects. So you would present maybe four or five proje projects to the committee, the rest of the seven or ten projects would get approved automatically as long as no one had a question about it. So right. the board and the project review committee that, again, had the fiduciary obligation to approve it, they would not actually even review the projects that in many cases were conflicted by board members. Okay, so uh, Ms. Vasharan claimed, every, uh, was there anything else in her testimony that you thought was... Uh, not truthful to the committee? Um, I think another thing to mention is when we're talking about the COVID payments that existed, one of the things that continues to not be described is the context of what happened because board members had actually agreed to not provide a second COVID payment in October of 2020. Okay, well, um, we're going to come to the COVID payments if we could because I have short time and a couple of other questions. Um, other directors, you mentioned Andre Lise Matot, who uh, was a beneficiary of this. She actually left the SDTC board and went to the Infrastructure Bank board. The Liberals appointed her there, and then she approved the was part of the team that approved 170 million for the chair of the SDTC board's project. But when I go, when I I go through some of these things, it's sort of while her time was on the board. Are you aware of uh, and and that term? Alberta, Biofuels, MindSense, Spark Microsystems, Concentric Agriculture, Polystyrovarant. There's about 20 or 30 companies here that uh, Ms. Mato had financial interest in through Cycle Capital. While she was on the board, they received $114 million, it seems, by my calculations. So uh, was this part of the problem that's going on? You, you get as Andre Lise Mateau got $117 million and she goes to the infrastructure bank and helps out her friend who got her this? Correct. I think the board members and a lot of um, public, uh, you know, there's this excuse that continues to be perpetuated that this is a small industry and we cannot find anyone else within this small industry that has this technical expertise to approve projects. That's a false narrative. There are thousands of people. Canada's a huge country they had the right people, they could find the right people to not have conflicts, but that didn't happen. They purposefully allowed... There's no way these few conflicts. board members represented 82% of the green technology industry in Canada. Exactly. 
Yeah. And again, the issue is they are at the front of the line, not just at SDTC, at all these other organizations, BDC, EDC, the Infrastructure Bank. They are friendly with everyone there, and their companies get money from SDTC. Then they go to the next organization using the approvals and due diligence from SDTC, and they continue going, and it's this perpetual cycle where it's funding from crown corporations, so, government that so, continue. So do you think, do you think the, the Auditor General only did 228 of over 400 transactions in the audit period and identified 390 million of 800 million that was inappropriately allocated to directors, conflicts of interest and outside the con. Do you think the rest of those transactions, uh, the other 200 or so, uh, it represent the same amount. So could we possibly de be dealing with about 700 million, maybe uh, 800 million almost, of money that was conflicted? Thank you, Mr. Perkins. I'll allow the witness to answer. I don't think so. Again, uh, I would have to look at the projects and to see what that Thank you. looks like. Thank you very much. Mr. Stewart, you have the floor for five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you for being here today, <clears throat> to the whistleblower. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask for through the chair is that if you would, uh, for the production of documents for the unredacted interim RCGT report and the unredacted final RCGT report, is that something that we can get here? It's through the witness. I think that's through the witness. So through the witness, if, if yeah. The witness, witness is able I don't have to, the unredacted table. reports. I have them, like, I have one that's partially less redacted than what was given to the committee, so... I can provide that, but the only thing I can provide for that interim report is the audio recordings and the transcript, which again, verbatim, is the um, partner okay. at... That's, I, we appreciate that. Um, there was another thing as well, before I get into this, um, we were also looking for the, in addition to the recordings, there's still an interest here to get copies of the historic contribution agreements. Um, as well as the updated, uh, I understand there's some policy changes and there's an updated contribution agreement. Are you able to provi provide both of those agreements as well? Uh, I think so. I think maybe the, uh, I don't know if I have the most ratified one for the most updated, but I can provide like, you know, contribution agreements like six, seven, eight, and nine, the ones that would be relevant to the time period that we're talking about. Can the committee produce that uh, in the production of documents? The most recent ones? That's. I think you'd have to ask ISET or the um, SDTC to provide the most recent one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, just um, has anybody been fired in the bureaucracy after everything that's been discussed here? Has anybody been fired? I think there's been a lot of convenient retirements. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. You know, this is really, I heard my colleague from South Shore St. Margaret's call it a culture of corruption. Um, it's actually next level corruption with adrenaline shots and then steroids to follow that. This is the worst scandal I've seen in my time here. One of the questions I have um, is with the contribution agreements, like, in provincially, I was a minister. If we wanted to spend outside the threshold, I know this is different, but we would have to go to the executive council, and then we could maybe spend more if that was something that, that the government was going to do. It doesn't Parliament have to approve spending outside of what the contribution agreements lay out? I think with regards to maybe some of those payments or things, um, SDTC was always below the targeted spending that gave the executives their bonuses, so... A lot of these approvals were made to offset what was still available to them under the contribution agreement. So let's say you had a target to spend, because again, the incentive structures at SDTC were based on how much money you spent and how fast you sent it out, not how effectively you used it. And in certain cases, when you didn't meet that target threshold that you needed, you would then provide some level of you know automated funding or something like these COVID payments to meet the amount that yeah. you were technically available to give out. But it, but $58 million was spent by the board outside of the contribution agreements, which to me seems like a legal behavior by the board, but I, I would assume that only Parliament could approve spending estimates. That's, what, that's where I was curious on that. Potentially. I'm not a lawyer. 
Yeah, me neither. So next question. Uh, the minister claims the department became aware of mismanaged conflict at the start of the year in 2023, but it's potentially apparent that the minister could have become aware as early as May 2022 uh, based on audio recordings. In your assessment, how likely is it that the minister was more than aware much before early of 2023? I think it's unlikely. I think George Shahal is just lying, honestly. But I would assume, like, from some of the conversations I had within that ISAT investigation, there were indications that there had been other problems previously reported to ISAT as it pertains to SDTC or its executives or board. So there is the possibility that there was something that was potentially known to ISAT prior to this situation, but maybe nothing as specific to the situation that we're talking about right now. So essentially what you're saying, though, is the ADM who was privy to all of it, I don't remember the individual's surname at this moment, but that ADM would have had to brief the deputy minister, and it's the deputy minister's responsibility to brief the minister. That's a lot of time going by. It seems very unlikely that the minister wasn't aware. Correct. Do you believe he was aware? Outside of George Shahal, just what, what do you believe? Like, do you believe the minister was aware that this was all going on? I believe that during the time at which that March 2023 to October, he was aware of the situation the whole time. He was not just given an awareness at March and then he conveniently forgot about the situation for eight months up until the point because, again, within the context of the conversation that occurred, one of the things that was continuously explained to myself was the fact that there was always this political pressure on the ADM and the deputy minister to give updates and provide, you know, some sort of a, an end of this investigation. So the only reason that would happen is if there was a continuous conversation back and forth about the situation. Thank you very much. That is the time.